topic that I would like to touch base on that's very, very critical, um, certainly in this country and Canada, but I will address it from a USA or quote American perspective is enrollment or the certificate degree of Indian blood or whatever it's called in different parts of the country or among different tribes. If we go back in history in what is now the USA Enrollment basically started with the 13 original colonies and the reservation status that they started establishing as the founding fathers, quote unquote, started putting our people on reservations or driving them further and further west, the Indian agent, the missionary, or the military were in charge of that particular reservation or tribal area where Indian people were forcibly being contained. And I say that again, forcibly being contained. So in the morning, whomever was in charge on the European side, the American side, had to do a nose count to make sure that all of the John Doe's and Susie Q's were there, that they hadn't gone off to hunt or to fish or to trade or just to get away. So that is how the U.S. government started documenting Indian people in the U.S. That is how the U.S. government began to say this person is Indian of this tribe, of this nation that continues on to today. So the U.S. government started a process beneficial to them, and I underline beneficial to them, whereby they could control our life on a daily basis. Take the De Delaware. They come from the state of Delaware originally. The enrolled members now basically have a small land base in Oklahoma. So that's one of the tribes that has history of a trail of tears. A long time ago from up in the Northeast so the Delaware people at one time <clears throat> were being counted to make sure that they were where they were supposed to be according to the U.S. government. And the counting was done, as I said, by the Indian agent, by a missionary, or the military, or maybe a combination of. So we, in this country and in Canada, were just like the indigenous people in Mexico, Central and South America. I spent a couple of weeks, a couple of times, with the Yanomamo people way out in the rainforest, way out in the jungle of Venezuela, and maybe crossed over to what is now Brazil. They know nothing about enrollment. They know their name, which 
they're very careful not to say out loud because their great spirit does not like for them to do that. So our people south of the U.S. border, as it is, cross over, some of them into what is traditional homeland, and they're considered because of the racism and prejudice of white people or Eurocentric thinking people as Mexican. They're not Indian, they're Mexican. Well, <laughs> you know, Mexican is a political term, just like American is a political term. It's not an ethnicity. Yeah. I'm a member of the Apache Nation and a citizen of the United States. My ethnicity is in the Apache of the Lipan on my mom's side and the Mescalero on my dad's side. So in this country and in Canada, if you have no proof that piece of paper from the U.S. or the Canadian government that says that you are enrolled, then you are not who you are. And let me bring it to Oklahoma because there are now 39 federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma. I have friends. I have been in and out of Oklahoma since 1972. Since 1974 to 1995, professionally and personally. I spend a lot of time at powwows, at stomp dances on the eastern sector, basketball tournaments and softball tournaments. So I have friends, I have family Indian way in Oklahoma who may be four, five, six different tribes because of the intermarriage. And I will talk about that in a minute. So here is John Doe or Susie Q who were born and raised in Indian country. Everybody knows who they are because they live a traditional life. They play Indian ball, basketball or fast pit softball. They're on the bowling team. They go to powwows. They go to the Indian church. They go to stomp dances, etc. But, according to the U.S. government, they're not Indian because they do not have enough degree of Indian blood to prove that they can be a member of any one tribe. Now, I'm going to clarify that a little bit. Some of the tribes will accept you for political reasons, to be a voting member of a tribe. They will accept you for political reasons to be a voting member of a tribe. And you have a piece of paper or a card that says, I am a member of. But when it comes to the benefits that the U.S. government committed themselves to by treaty, they have no rights. Having said that, most of the treaties, in a very simple way, the U.S. government said, you quit fighting, you give up most of your land, and in return, we will provide health services, education services, and social services. That is the basis 
of pretty much all of the treaties. Quit fighting, give up your land, or we'll exterminate you. And in return, we will provide health, education, and social services. The reality is that we quit fighting. They forcibly took most of the land and are still wanting more and rarely ever provided health, education, or social services. And history in this nation and in Canada is replete with stories of the fact that we, as indigenous people, never broke a treaty. The U.S. government did and continues to do because of greed. It boils down to money. So the enrollment process I've talked about, the consequences I have just talked about, part of the consequences of reservations, and I will again use Oklahoma as an example because of what happened and is happening Boarding schools were established. So the Indian agent, the military, or the, and or the missionary or a combination would come onto a reservation or a tribal land area in the case of Oklahoma because only Osage is a reservation and that's only two feet below topsoil, the mineral rights. Anybody can own land in Osage county two feet up. That's a different story. So children from Indian families were taken. Here's Mrs. John Doe. She and her husband have five children. Five. Along comes a missionary, the Indian agent, and or the military, and they say, huh, I'm going to take this three, as young as age four, three, four, up. They're sent to a boarding school, either in the state of Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, California, of back east and that happened over and over and over again early reservation days boarding schools our children hair was cut especially the boys they had to look like little soldiers dress like little soldiers march to and from the classroom like little soldiers they were punished for speaking the only language they knew so the good of the bad is that some of those children begin to establish friendships and relationships with children of other nations. They started helping each other to survive that horrific environment that they were put into by force. So that started a kinship, a relationship of what I call intertribal. Later on comes the program <laughs> of relocation. So under the relocation program, same thing, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Indian agent, the military, well, not so much the military by then, but the missionaries decided that Indian people needed to be mainstreamed and made like us, like white people. You go off the reservation, you're going to go to a city, we're going to give you some money to get there, we're going to give you some money while you're there, we're going to send you to school, 
and you're going to become a civilized American. White thinking, white acting. Well, the reality is that yes and no. But what happened is that then people from throughout the country who wound up in L.A., Chicago, Denver, Minneapolis, Dallas, etc., came together from a home environment where family, all of the grandparents are grandparents, all of the parents are parents, no cousins or brothers and sisters, so you come from a very good, strong kinship system, and all of a sudden you're around a bunch of native people who have the same commonality, who have the same understanding of spirituality, but there are some differences. And they come from the Dakotas, or they come from uh, Hoopa, California, or they come from the Navajo Nation, or wherever. And urban Indian centers come into being. And urban Indian churches, primarily Baptist and Methodist, come into being. So people in urban areas begin to go to powwows, intertribal, to be around other Indian people. They go to the Indian church to be around other Indian people. They go to basketball tournaments, softball tournaments, they go to bowling leagues. The commonality of we as indigenous people are more comfortable around our people than other people. During the day we go to school, during the day we go to work, during the day we do whatever it is that we need to do to survive. But on weekends or in the evenings, we go home to mix and mingle with our people. Or whenever you have vacation time, you actually go home because we all know where home is. I am probably one of the few Indian men that has always said North Pole to South Pole is Indian country and I am home wherever I am. That's my attitude. That's my belief, but that's me. I do know where home is geographically. I know my people. I know where I come from. I know my history. So, so the impact of trying to change us continuously from annihilation, from the disease in the blankets that they gave to us, that they brought to us, like syphilis, gonorrhea, you know, and some of the others, tuberculosis, uh, they set out sometimes in more than one way to try and destroy us and get rid of us because they came with nothing, as I said earlier, from countries, from governments where the serfs were slaves or less. They had no rights and they come here and all of a sudden it's like, wow, you know, I can own as much land as I can control. I can be a king. <laughs> and that's <laughs> That's where that term, my grandmother or my great-grandmother was a Cherokee princess. Always Cherokee and always princess. And my question has always been, well, if your grandma or your great-grandma was a princess, and if she had brothers, were they a prince? And was the mother a queen and the father a king? 
and uh, and I did that and do that tongue in cheek because we indigenous people laugh, tease, and joke about again the need of foreign immigrants who came here naked, knew nothing about how to live in a new environment, were taken care of by our people, have an incredible need to put themselves at a level of what was back home. My mother was a Cherokee princess. Well, you know, that's old country. It has nothing to do with us as native traditional people. So that whole mishmash that I've been talking about right now has caused horrendous problems for native people. My great-grandfather, my grandfather's father, is written up in the military journals, especially from the era of the Republic of Texas as Chief Gomez, Mescalero Apache. His name in our language is Negoyani, Old Man of Wisdom. Chief Gomez <laughs> has a reputation in written history as having terrorized the San Antonio Road from the 1840s to the 1860s. The San Antonio Road being from present San Antonio, Texas into El Paso, Texas, across into Chihuahua, Old Mexico, and across into southeastern New Mexico, where present-day Mescalero is at. Now, how can my relative have been terrorizing when he's protecting and defending his people and our rights? Was he enrolled? No. When Mirabu Lamar became president, the second president of what is now Texas, the republic back then, his attitude was real simple. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. So the Cherokees that Sam Houston brought into the Cherokee Strip in East Texas were told, you go back to Oklahoma or we'll kill you. The other tribes or tribal members of different tribes that had been forcibly brought into Oklahoma that had migrated south into what was Mexico, Texas now, were given the same choice. You go back to Oklahoma, you go to New Mexico, we're going to kill you, or you become Mexican nationals. Well, what happened to the Apache people, the Coahuiltecan people, the Tamaulipecan people, the Karankawa, that stayed? Because the Tonkawa, the Caddo, the Comanche, the Kiowa, and the Kiowa Apache basically went to Oklahoma. That was the choice they made. But some of the other tribal people didn't want to leave. So they said, no. My relatives said, we do not want to be federal Indians. My grandpa was born 1878. So he, his older brothers and sisters, and the second wife's grandpas and grandmas to me, all had the same story. We are not going to leave our homes. You can call us whatever you want. You can try and do to us whatever you want. But we are going to survive here. So, 
most of my relatives refused to become enrolled. There were treaties that were written up between the Republic of Texas and later the U.S. government. And I don't know that it's worth anything anywhere. So, personally, professionally, for me, my family, my daughter, my son, my grandchildren, that issue of enrollment that started back in the 13 original colonies in this country has caused us incredible problems. And it is so painful to me when some of our traditional people, whose primary language is their native language, whose primary culture is their traditional culture, cross over here for whatever reason, and they are denied, not only by the U.S. government and U.S. citizens, but by indigenous people, the recognition that they are tribal people, and in some ways are more vested in their traditions and culture than we are in this country and in Canada. The racism that we as indigenous people in this country have taken on that learned behavior of trauma causes us to be just as ugly and just as nasty as the white people that we don't like. But we act just like them toward a lot of our brothers and sisters. Why? Learn behavior. I'm going to share a story that's kind of funny in some ways, but poignant in other ways. I was in uh, Colorado with uh, Mary Ann Thompson Frank, who's co-founder and president of the Memnesian Institute that I'm a, a member of, I'm a board member. And uh, the wife of one of the chairmen of the Ute, one of the Ute tribes, shared this and she said she had gone to a 7-Eleven to buy tobacco for ceremonial purposes. And the man behind the counter told her, no, 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 you can't buy tobacco, it's not good for you. And she looked at him, she said, you Mexican, why don't you go back to where you come from? So, and she said it with an attitude. And the man says, you speak your language? So I just looked at him, like, what are you talking about? And then he started talking to me in my language. And I just looked at him like, how do you know my language? Well, it just happened that the Utoastecan language has the same base, language base. So here's a man from present-day Mexico who is vested in his language, his culture, his traditions, speaking to a Ute woman who is vested in her culture, her language, her traditions. And all of a sudden, there's this kinship, this brotherhood that is established by a, quote, Mexican who won't sell me tobacco and a very traditional tribal woman whose husband happens to be the chairman of 
<laughs> you know, she, she told the story and I just sat there <laughs> and laughed and cried. And I thought, you know, these are the kinds of stories that we need to share as indigenous people. These are the kinds of stories that are happening today, not because we want, but because we are trying to survive in what they have developed, taught, and pushed on us. So I want to leave the uh, folks out there with that story and I hope you, each one of you thinks about it, prays about it, and uh, hopefully there will, will be changes that take place between we the native people of this country in Canada with those that are south of us. And I am going to add this footnote. We also need to remember something that's critically important is that the U.S. and Mexico are governments that divided many of our nations. Canada and the United States are governments that divided many of our nations. The Apache Nation covered the state of Tamaulipas, Coahuila, Nuevo León, Chihuahua, and Sonora in present-day old Mexico, anywhere some 50 to probably 150 miles south. On this side, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, parts of Colorado, and Kansas. So when the governments formed, a lot of our people, the Apache people, chose to stay in their traditional land areas, Mexico. When I was little, there was a lot of coming and going back and forth. It's become more difficult and more difficult. And with people like Bubba Bush and his wall and the current president and his rhetoric, it's becoming impossible. And some of the same thing happens to our people on the U.S.-Canadian border. I have experienced those kinds of things, particularly when I have been visiting my family, my Mohawk family at Aquasasne and St. Regis. Uh, who?